Our story begins with a small wizard girl being pursued by an intimidating looking knight riding a horse. And this unknown knight character uses his magic, presumably, to summon a bunch of creatures and monsters that surround the wizard girl. And with no options left, she uses her magic to summon forth a knight to defeat all these creatures, one as swift as the wind. And then a portal opens up in the sky and out pops... Oh yeah, this is a Sonic the Hedgehog game, I forgot that. A very fitting little introduction for Sonic in this game, in a world very unfamiliar to him, and he feels very out of place that he gets such a comical introduction. And also, this is one of the first times we have ever seen Sonic eating a chili dog in a Sonic game, that thing from the American cartoons that was never part of the game canon. By now, at this point in the Sonic series, they had decided to incorporate that into the main game canon. But I'm gonna talk about that more when we get to the Unleashed story videos, so we'll just go on for now. Anyway, Sonic's like, where the heck am I? And the wizard girl comes up to him and says that I'm sorry for the abrupt summons, but I need your help with this stuff. And then, you know, Sonic takes a look around, sees all the monsters, sees the scary nightman. He's like, okay, I get the picture. I know how this kind of thing works. No prob, I can handle it. And then, of course, Sonic does his thing, and we get a cute little gag with him and the chili dog there. That's fun. And now all that's left is to take care of this night guy, and he and Sonic stare each other down for a little bit. You can see Sonic is not really taking things too seriously. And right as Sonic is about to charge in, he gets stopped by this wizard girl, who then pulls him away and uses her magic to transport the two away. And I like how Sonic, in this whole moment, the only thing that he's really concerned about is, No, my chili dog! That's funny. This opening cutscene is really, really good. The production value of it is obviously extremely high, and it's very entertaining. It's interesting, it's gripping, it's funny, it's amusing. It's got everything you would want. Uh, and after Sonic and this mysterious wizard character leave, then the knight goes up to his group of knights, who are represented by Sonic characters, and he's like, track them down. If you find them, then kill them. I'm gonna go search out on my own. But after he leaves, the knights discuss amongst themselves of like, should we really kill her? She's the royal court's wizard. But then the other one's like, this is an order. We have to do what the king says. Following the king's order is a knight's way towards chivalry. And so the three decide to comply with the king's orders. However, one of them is left lamenting that the king has changed, and so has this land. And now we shift over to the same kind of cutscenes that we saw in Sonic and the Secret Rings, these kind of motion comic style of scenes. However, you can definitely tell that the production value and the budget of Sonic and the Black Knight is quite a bit more than Secret Rings was. These cutscenes are far more well done than they were in the last game. A lot more animation, they less rely on like the comic book style, and use a lot more like full-size images, and they have a lot more motion to them. These are definitely quite a step up from the previous game. And actually, someone left a comment on my Secret Ring story video that I'm kind of inclined to agree with now that I think about it that these cutscenes are actually a lot better than the cutscenes that we find in a lot of Sonic games for the most part. Because, to be honest, a lot of the time the animation in Sonic games isn't that great in the cutscenes. A lot of the time there's not very good pacing or directing, and the animations themselves are very stiff and just not really that appealing looking. The cutscenes are oftentimes just a lot of characters standing around and talking to each other, and things can get kind of awkward very regularly. So these kinds of cutscenes that have a little bit more budgetary approach to them end up actually being superior because they have better directing and pacing and flow. And so in that way, even though these are kind of budget cutscenes, they end up being better than the cutscenes that we find in most Sonic games, and so the story actually ends up being more engaging thanks to them. Just goes to show that just because you put more work into something doesn't automatically mean it's better. Anyway, as for what's going on in this scene, Sonic goes to the wizard girl and he's like, Why'd you stop me? I could have taken him. But then she explains that you couldn't, as that knight is actually King Arthur, and right now he is immortal. Thanks to the scabbard of Excalibur he has, he cannot be killed. Is that a part of Arthurian legend? I've never heard that before, but I guess that's what we're going for in Sonic and the Black Knight at the very least. And then, of course, we have a moment where Sonic's like, Wait a minute, King Arthur, I've heard this before. And then the wizard explains that, yes, this is the world of King Arthur and all that stuff. Once again, Sonic has been pulled into the world of a storybook, just like what happened in Secret Rings. And uh, then these two give their introductions, and we finally learn the name of this character, Merlina, which obviously is a play on Merlin from Arthurian legend. 
And she basically gives Sonic the rundown of what happened, of once King Arthur acquired Excalibur and the scabbard of it that granted him immortality, then it changed him, and it caused him to just want to plunge the world into chaos, and he summoned a bunch of monsters from the underworld to ruin everything. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, if you couldn't tell, this game's story is written by Shiro Maikawa, the same guy who wrote Sonic Adventure 2. You can definitely tell that in the way Sonic is written in this game. He's got that more snarky attitude reminiscent of American Sonic that you see in Shiro Maikawa's interpretation of the character. Anyway, with King Arthur being corrupted by the scabbard of Excalibur, obviously Sonic and Merlina need to defeat him, but Sonic's like, how are we going to beat an immortal? And Merlina points him in the direction of a nearby misty lake, where apparently a sacred sword sleeps that, I guess, could get the job done. So of course Sonic's like, alright, no problem, I'll go grab that, but before he leaves, Merlina gives him a gauntlet? For some reason, I don't really know why, and this never turns up to be relevant at all at any point in the story. They just wanted Sonic to have a gauntlet in this game because it's Sonic and the Black Knight, so they wanted him wearing armor. Uh, whatever. Uh, so Sonic and Merlina make their way over to the sword, which is buried inside of a stone, and then Sonic goes to pull it, but before he does, Merlina's like, do you really want to do this? Because if you take that sword and you use it to kill King Arthur, then that means that you are a Kingslayer, the worst of all knights. And Sonic's like, eh, whatever, that's fine, I don't really care. You know, Sonic's whole mantra of life, of just, I'm gonna do whatever I want and not really worry about things too much. If he thinks it's the right thing to do, then he's going to do it, regardless of how it's going to be perceived by the world around him. So, Sonic pulls the sword out of the stone, and Merlina explains that this sword is Caliburn. And Sonic's like, uh, oh, it's kind of a crummy sword, isn't it? But then it turns out Caliburn comes to life, and Sonic freaks out at that and throws him in the air, and oh god, what's happening? But then once things calm down, then Merlina explains that the sword Caliburn has a will of its own, and it chooses who is going to be worthy of wielding it. And right off the bat, Caliburn is not too impressed with the person that pulled him from the stone. He starts insulting Sonic, calling him just a knave. How could someone like you pull me from the stone? You're definitely not worthy of being called a knight. And Sonic is like, boy, this sword sure has an attitude on it. And then Caliburn's like, as soon as someone pulls me out of the sword, I have to relentlessly put them to the test and ensure that they are worthy of wielding me. And a simple knave such as yourself is going to take a lot of teaching in order to get there. And as soon as he says that, as it turns out, King Arthur manages to find Sonic and Merlina. And so Sonic's like, all right, sword, you better get teaching right now because it's go time. Sonic and King Arthur have a bit of a sword fight with each other, and Sonic actually manages to win the fight because it's a video game and he's Sonic and he can do everything because he's like the ultimate Mary Sue. But even after being defeated, it doesn't matter because the scabbard revives King Arthur and he's ready to go again. And then Sonic's like, this isn't doing anything. What kind of sacred sword are you to Caliburn? And Caliburn's like, it's not me, it's you. You're a terrible swordsman. That's the real problem here. And then King Arthur scoffs and he's like, huh, not even worth killing. Some knight you are, even though he just got his ass kicked. Sounds like salt to me. And then Caliburn's like, see, even he thinks you suck. And uh, King Arthur skedaddles out of there for some reason, even though I thought he was there to kill Sonic and Merlina. You'd think that if he's immortal, he would just keep coming at them until he won, but... It's a video game, so since he was defeated, he decides to retreat for no reason. You'd think at the very least he could use his magic to signal to the other knights so they could know where he was and they could all converge on this location and they could all group up on Sonic and beat him easily, but whatever, we're moving on. So Sonic and Caliburn continue their bickering and Merlina shows up and is like, yep, we can't defeat King Arthur, he truly is immortal. And so Caliburn suggests that they find the original owner of the scabbard, the Lady of the Lake, and that perhaps she would know a way to seal the scabbard's power and that would stop Arthur from being immortal. So Sonic's like, all right, let's go see the Lady of the Lake. And then uh, Sonic and Caliburn do a bit more bickering back and forth. And then Sonic asks what Merlina plans on doing, but uh, she... Oh, 
Okay, that was a little bit random there, Merlina, but uh, whatever, you do you. Anyway, she explains that she can't go into Castletown as she's going to be recognized by the townspeople, and of course she is a fugitive being hunted by King Arthur right now, so she's gonna have to separate from Sonic and Caliburn for the time being. So those two go off on their own for now. And now that we have all of the setup and premise, and we kind of have the story plot beginning to move forward a little bit, I want to talk about a couple of things here, because that was just a whole lot of stuff to digest, and there's a lot to talk about. First topic I want to touch on is that, boy howdy, by this point in the Sonic series, we are well past having jumped the shark, aren't we? You know, there are many Sonic games that have just, like, weird-ass premises that really do not fit Sonic whatsoever and do weird shit. A lot of the games from, like, the mid to late 2000s, people just, like, you look at them and you're like, what are you doing? Why are you doing what you're doing? You know, we had Shadow the Hedgehog with guns, we had Sonic kissing a human in 06, riding hoverboards, turning into a werewolf, and now Sonic is using a sword. It comes off as they were just out of natural, organic ways to continue and expand the Sonic series, and so they were just going with whatever random ideas came to mind that had absolutely nothing to do with Sonic. When you look at each of these individual things, you can see and understand why these choices were made. But if you just look at the trend overall, then you're just like, my god, why is the Sonic series doing all this weird random crap in this period of time? And it also doesn't help that pretty much all of these games were getting middling to bad reception at this period of time, so it really just felt like the Sonic series was just a giant pile of shit at this point. And I can totally understand why people would see it that way. In fact, I partially agree with that. Like, at this point, the series had gone so off the rails, and there was, like, no direction, no vision for it. It was just a bunch of different teams all making different Sonic games at the same time, not coordinating with each other, not communicating, just doing whatever the fuck they wanted. And it resulted in Sonic turning into this weird jumbled mess with no true identity. Really, the only line of games that was sticking true to, like, the core nature of Sonic around this time was the handheld games with the Advance and Rush series, but those were just handheld games, and so they were completely buried by this giant wave of random crap in all the main console games. And that's not to say that these things are bad. I like most of these games. It's just, why? Why are we doing this? Why are we giving Sonic guns? Why are we turning him into a werewolf thing? Why are we giving him a sword and having him fight with knights and shit? Like, what does any of this have to do with Sonic? Pretty much absolutely nothing. I know there's a lot of people out there that like the versatility of Sonic, that the series is able to handle all these different things, but personally, I completely disagree with that. I don't think the series is versatile. I think that the series had no direction for a very long period of time, and so it was just doing random stuff, and so having no direction became the direction of the series, which I don't think is good. That's how you get a series that, over time, loses its identity, which is exactly what happened to Sonic. And also, it's not like a lot of these things came from some artistic vision, like guns were just shoved into Shadow the Hedgehog because games were trying to get more edgy and dark at that time, and the Werehog was thrown in there so we could shoehorn action gameplay into Unleashed. That's the only reason that's there. In the case of Black Knight, this game exists because, oh, swinging the Wii Remote, that's like swinging a sword. Bam, Sonic with a sword. Genius. That's the kind of reasoning that led to this game's existence. Are you fucking kidding me? Compare that to the original Sonic games up to, I would say, about Sonic Adventure 2, where there is a clear, consistent vision for what the series is, that grows and expands over time, with, you know, changes here and there, but generally all still pointed in relatively the same direction. And then after that game, which had a feeling of finality to it, things started to just go off in whatever direction they felt like, and I don't really think that was for the best. But that's what they wanted to do, so I guess we just gotta deal with it. The other thing I want to touch on now is Caliburn as a character, because I quite like Sonic and Caliburn's relationship. Caliburn kind of takes the role of Shara as Sonic's companion through the adventure that's going to be talking him while you play through all the levels and stuff. But unlike Shara and a lot of characters that Sonic meets along the way in his adventure, 
Halliburton does not respect Sonic at all. He thinks very, very lowly of Sonic, and I quite like that. There's a lot of genuinely amusing back and forth between these two characters of Sonic giving Caliburn a hard time for being a useless piece of junk sword, and then Caliburn saying that, you know, he's an unscrupulous, unrefined brute of a swordsman who has no idea what he's doing, and it's a really fun little relationship they have going on there. It's a good dynamic. Caliburn keeps calling Sonic Knave, and Sonic's like, I'm not a knave, my name's Sonic the Hedgehog. And Caliburn's like, all right, Knave the Hedgehog it is. And Sonic's just like, ugh, whatever, you dull piece of crap. I like Caliburn, he's a fun little character, and you know the idea of a magic talking sword? It's a very common thing you see in fantasy a lot, that I like that trope, I'm a big fan of it most of the time, and I think it works here pretty well. Uh, now getting back to the story, while on their way to see the Lady of the Lake, Sonic and Caliburn run into Shadow. I mean, not Shadow, not Shadow at all. This is Lancelot, one of the Knights of the Round Table. And Lancelot immediately challenges Sonic to a duel, and Sonic's just like, Aha, uh -huh. you know, this is a very familiar pattern that he's seen before with, uh, this kind of guy. You know, this isn't Sonic's first time being in one of these storybooks, and so he kind of starts to get the idea pretty quickly here that that's not actually Shadow, it's someone that looks like him due to his interpretation of the characters. And of course, with that, Lancelot also acts quite a bit like Shadow as well. And Lancelot asks Sonic as well, what are you gonna do? Are we going to fight or are you going to flee? And Sonic's like, I'm gonna flee. But then Caliburn's like, no, a true knight never backs down to his foe. And Lancelot demands to hear the name of who his opponent is gonna be. And Caliburn's like, his name is Knave the Hedgehog and he accepts your challenge. And then he jumps right into Sonic's hands and he's like, good, I guess I have to fight now. So this is what I'm talking about with the good dynamics between Sonic and Caliburn, where, like, Caliburn works as, like, the touchstone for the world that Sonic is in. You know, this world of knights and chivalry and duty and all that. And that is, like, completely polar opposite to Sonic and his personality and the way that he thinks about things. And so there's, like, a constant butting heads of what Sonic is supposed to be doing in the context of this world and what he actually wants to do. And because of that, he has a clash with Caliburn and it results in these kinds of fun scenarios like this, where now Lancelot's like, Knave the Hedgehog, I'm going to defeat you. You know, Sonic, he doesn't give a flying shit for any of this chivalry or knightly whatever crap. He just wants to beat the bad guy and get things over with, but uh, everyone else is like, we have to do this the knightly, honorable way. And that's just so opposite of how Sonic feels about things. And Caliburn sees this and he's like, this guy, he's never gonna be a knight. He's an idiot. He doesn't understand anything. It's some good stuff. And it also works as a bit of an arc that we're going to see over the course of the story. But uh, back on track, Sonic manages to defeat Lancelot once again because he's a video game character and he beats all the boss fights. And Caliburn even comments that it must have been pure luck that you managed to beat Lancelot. There's no way you could have done that. And Sonic's like, yeah, I don't know. I think I did pretty good. And then Caliburn asks why Sonic didn't deliver the finishing blow. You know, in this world of knights and honor and all that, then compassion like that can be taken as like dishonoring your opponent. But again, Sonic doesn't care about any of that stuff. So he's like, whatever, it doesn't matter. But then also Sonic explains that he took Lancelot's sword for no apparent reason. He just did that. Uh, okay, sure, whatever. Anyway, Sonic and Caliburn finally make their way to the Lady of the Lake, who, as it turns out, is being played by Amy. And Sonic has a little bit of a freak out there, because, oh god, Amy, she's after me! And Caliburn's like, mind your manners, this is the Lady of the Lake, you fool. Show some respect, bow to her. And Sonic kind of bows, and he's just like, uh, uh, okay, I guess this is what I'm supposed to do. And Nimue explains that she already knows why they're here. It's about Excalibur, and Sonic's like, yeah, and he gets a little bit too, uh, friendly. And once again, Caliburn's like, don't get so close to her, you idiot. And after Sonic backs away a bit, then Nimue explains that she feels guilty for what's happened to the kingdom, as she's the one that gave King Arthur Excalibur's scabbard, so in a way, his corruption is her fault. 
And so, she wants to ensure that whoever is going to defeat King Arthur and thus get the scabbard from him is someone that will not be susceptible to the same corruption that the king was. And so, before she tells Sonic how to seal the scabbard and defeat King Arthur, she wants him to perform some tests to prove that he is truly worthy. He's got to free some prisoners from King Arthur's prison, he's got to help some people in need, and he has to defeat some of King Arthur's army of monsters. And if he can do all of those three in three days, then Nimue will tell him how to defeat Arthur. And Caliburn's like, oh, this is a pretty tough test. Do you think you're going to be able to handle it? And Sonic's like, heh, no one's faster than me. I'll complete these tests in no time. Just watch, by the end of this, I'm going to be a true knight. And just as he says, Sonic manages to complete all of the tests, with a little bit of time left, but cutting things kind of close. However, on his way back to see the Lady of the Lake, he runs into a child who is crying on the road, and she explains that her entire village was attacked by a dragon, and her family was taken into the dragon's lair. And after a bit of pondering, Sonic asks the kid which way the dragon took everybody, to which she points Sonic in the right direction. And Caliburn's like, hey, whoa, what are you doing? If we go do this, then we're gonna be late, and we're not gonna be able to complete the lady's challenges. And Sonic's like, yeah. Yeah, maybe, but I don't really care. I'm gonna do what I want. But on the way to the dragon's cave, Sonic runs into another knight of the round table, Gawain, played by Knuckles. Sonic tries to explain that he's in a bit of a hurry. He's trying to save a bunch of people from a dragon, but Gawain is hearing none of it. He has to follow the king's orders and take down Sonic, and so the two fight and Sonic manages to defeat Gawain, who is feeling so ashamed at losing to a mere apprentice, not even a proper knight, that he intends to take his own life to reclaim his honor. But Sonic takes the sword right out of his hand and is like, what are you talking about? There's no need to kill yourself, it's fine. And Gawain throws a bit of a fit here, saying that this is about his chivalry. He failed as a knight by being unable to fulfill the king's orders. But then Sonic asks Gawain the simple question of, isn't there anything else to being a knight than serving a king? Which that question manages to affect Gawain. And then Sonic just leaves him there. He's like, later, I gotta go save some people now. See what I was saying before? Again, we have Sonic's mentality in the way of, you know, old traditional knights and chivalry and honor, butting heads with each other, and Sonic being like, all this shit is stupid and doesn't make any sense, and you people are kind of weird, and, you know, he's starting to open up these people's eyes and realize that, uh, the way of the night doesn't mean you have to throw away your life for no reason in the glorious name of your king and all that. Anyway, Sonic and Caliburn manage to free all of the people from the cave, and Caliburn's like, we are way past the appointed time. We are screwed when it comes to the ladies' tests. And Sonic's like, I know. But then they run into the kid from before, who thanks Sonic for saving her family and everyone from her village. And then she apologizes for deceiving Sonic, as it turns out that this kid was in reality the Lady of the Lake the whole time. It turns out that this was actually the true test to see whether or not Sonic was worthy of being a true knight. Would he be willing to sacrifice his opportunity in order to do what was actually right and help people in need, even if it was detrimental to him? And of course, Sonic being Sonic, he always does what's right, and so he managed to pass her real test. And so Nimue explains to Sonic that in order to seal the scabbard's power and defeat Arthur, Sonic is going to need to collect all of these sacred swords held by the Knights of the Round Table. He already has Lancelot and Gawain's sword, so all that's left is the Sword of Percival. Boy, it sure is convenient that Sonic was already collecting the Knight's swords for no particular reason ahead of time, even though he didn't know this was going to be a thing. That's pretty convenient, but whatever. Anyway, Sonic and Caliburn do a bit more bickering back and forth of, Oh, are you really going to be able to defeat Percival? I don't know. And Sonic's like, of course I will. I've got an incredible sacred sword by my side, don't I? And then Caliburn's like, J -j 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 of course, with a sword like me, there's no way you could ever be defeated. You know, their relationship's starting to change a little bit after Sonic is starting to prove himself as a knight. He's starting to get a little bit of respect for Caliburn. 
and vice versa. You know, this is classic story stuff. Two characters forced to work together, and at first they don't really like each other, but over the course of the adventure, they start to kind of feel a bit of attachment to one another. It's tried and true storytelling, and I think it works pretty well here. It especially does a good job of showing that Sonic is starting to earn his way as a proper knight. And now it's time for Sonic's showdown with Percival. I quite like that scene. Once again, we got that clash of the world of knights and Sonic of, like, Percival serving under King Arthur, dueling with Sonic, who is serving under nobody. Sonic just does whatever he wants. He's as free as the wind, and so Sonic names the wind itself as his master. Very, very fitting. I like that. And, of course, Sonic manages to defeat Percival, but then she, like, falls off a cliff and she's about to fall into some lava, but Sonic jumps down in after her. And Percival wonders why Sonic would save her life when she is his enemy, and his answer is pretty freaking good. うん、<笑> Again, I really, really like that scene, so I just wanted to let it play out. But uh, then Merlina shows up and she's like, I've been watching everything through my magic, and now you have everything you need to beat King Arthur, Sonic. You're really a true knight now. And Sonic's like, ah, oh, stop, you're making me blush. And Merlina says that after Sonic defeats Arthur to meet her back at Camelot Castle. And Sonic's like, all right, let's go finish things off. And Sonic goes to confront King Arthur once and for all.風の騎士、ソニックザヘッジオック。朝を今一度俺と勝負してもらうぜ。騎士の真似事がだいぶいい人についたようだな。おかげさまでな。そのブザマの剣、今一度見てやろう。見なきゃよかったと後悔するぜ
But it's not over yet, because then King Arthur mysteriously disappears, and all that's left is the scabbard. So Sonic takes the scabbard to Merlina at Camelot Castle, and he's like, I don't really know what happened, he just disappeared. To which Merlina responds that there never actually was a King Arthur, which is like, what? And she takes the scabbard from Sonic and is like, finally, I can replace King Arthur, my great-grandfather Merlin's biggest failure. And then, uh, Merlina, you're starting to look a little evil there, and, uh... <laughs> Oh no, so uh, Merlina starts using the power of the Scabbard of Excalibur to do something, I'm not entirely sure what, but she's basically using the eternal immortality that is granted by the Scabbard, and she's trying to spread that power throughout all of the kingdom. And then suddenly the budget kicks in and we get this, like, entirely pointless scene of Sonic and all the knights, like, running forward as the castle starts crumbling. And I don't know why they made this cutscene. This doesn't really forward the story very much. It's just, like, kind of cool, which, all right, I'm fine with that, I guess. Once everyone has gotten out of the castle, then they're looking at uh, what's going on. They're like, oh, so Merlina was the bad guy this whole time. Oh. And whatever she's doing, it's spreading, and it will eventually cover the entire kingdom. And Gawain's like, God damn it, what kind of knights are we just standing here while our kingdom falls to ruin? And then Sonic's like, is that it? You're all gonna give up? Is that as much as your chivalry can do? Like I said earlier, there's more to being a knight than just serving a king. And then the Lady of the Lake shows up and she's like, yes, if we use all four of everyone's sacred arms, then we can form up a barrier which will stop the spread of Merlina's dark power. And so Sonic gives back everyone their weapons, as if like, uh, are you with me kind of thing? To which their response is... <laughs> So, with that, everyone decides to go place their swords in each of the four quadrants to put up the barrier, and then once it's up, Sonic is going to go take on Merlina and try to settle things. And everyone does just that, placing their swords in these four magical tablets, although technically, isn't there five sacred swords because Gawain uses two swords? Whatever, shut up. But uh, another thing about Gawain's scene in particular is that he remarks that, you know, I've seen the king with Excalibur's scabbard, but I've never actually seen Excalibur itself before. I wonder where it is. Hmm. By the way, I skipped over this before, but uh, Sonic saw a blacksmith earlier that looked like Tails, who also happened to mention that the name Caliburn sounded a little bit familiar. I wonder what that could possibly be alluding to. But anyway, everyone gets the barrier up, and now Sonic goes to confront Merlina. And that he does, and Merlina is looking a little bit more evil these days. And before they start fighting, Sonic asks Merlina, what was this all about? What's the whole deal? Why did she deceive him? What is her goal here? And Merlina explains that basically she is aware that she is inside of a story, and she knows how the story is going to end. The kingdom of King Arthur, by the end of it all, eventually falls to ruin. That is why Merlina's great-grandfather Merlin created the King Arthur that we encountered earlier in the story, hoping that he would be able to find a way to escape from the inevitable ending of this story and avoid the death of this entire world. He was unable to do that, and so Merlina had to take things into her own hands, and she hopes that she will be able to use the Scabbard's power to prevent this world from dying and allow it to continue on forever. And now we get a flashback to before with Merlina's deal with the flower, which now makes sense. Merlina is afraid of death. And once Sonic connects those dots, he has something to say on the matter. <laughs> I need this. 
しましょう関係ないさ俺はただ俺の行きたい道を行きたいだけだソニックはい。And there's a lot to say about this scene, but I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later on. First, let's just get through the final cutscene and the ending of the game. Marina, in what kind of world is there? But, there is a lot of sadness in the world. In that world, the people who live in the world are able to make a lot of time to make a lot of time. I think so. I think so. After that, everybody else shows up and congratulates Sonic, to which he's like, it's thanks to all you guys. But then some of the knights begin talking about how there never really was an actual King Arthur, which I guess means that the knights of the round table are going to have to disband. But then Caliburn is like, what are you idiots talking about? I'm Excalibur, motherfuckers, which means I'm the one who gets to choose who's worthy of being king. Which means... Oh my god! A fun little gag to end things off on, I like that. Now let's talk about the deal with Merlina, because boy howdy are we touching on some pretty heavy themes there. Because obviously the deal with her in the story of Sonic and the Black Knight is a metaphor for accepting death. You know, Merlina is aware that the entire world of King Arthur is going to fall to ruin and effectively die, and she doesn't want that to happen, and so she's trying to resist death and do everything that she can to keep that from happening. She's afraid of dying, and then Sonic comes in to tell her that The fact that things end, the fact that we die, that is what makes life worth living, and the fact that we have a limited time, that's why we have to live life to the fullest, which is what Sonic always tries to do. 
it's a perfect example of a Sonic story, of Sonic helping someone through a difficult problem in their life that they're trying to deal with, and he shows them the way, and he shows them a way through this problem where they can think about it more positively. It's all exactly the kind of thing that I love to see from Sonic stories. However, to be honest, I think that this is a little bit much for a kid's story. Like, this theme is really fucking heavy. Like, we're getting into, like, existential issues here, which, fucking Christ, if you thought Sonic and the Secret Rings was gonna fly over a kid's head, this is really going to. Once again, I am appreciative of the Sonic series being willing to tackle tough topics like this, but to be honest, I think in this case they may have bitten off a bit more than they can chew. A lot of people really praise the story of Black Knight for handling this theme, but to be honest, the game doesn't really tackle it that well, if you ask me. First of all, Merlina is absent for the vast majority of the story, and she only really hints at this whole thing in that one scene with the flower there, so it's just an initial setup and then a payoff right here at the very end without a whole lot of fleshing out this theme in the middle of the story. Like, yeah, there's the idea of King Arthur using immortality and getting corrupted and all that, but it still doesn't do a whole lot with this theme. And at the end of the day, it all just boils down to Sonic explaining to someone how to solve the problem, which is a pretty common way to do a story arc like this in many stories, and it can work, like in real life, sometimes just hearing someone say the right thing is enough to get someone to change and realize the error of their ways, so that's fine, but in a story, I often feel like it's better if you can achieve this kind of arc in some more impactful means than someone literally just explaining things to that person. Like Sonic and the Secret Rings, for example. Sonic didn't just tell Shara that she was wrong for wanting to be with the Jin and that he was hurting her. Sonic made her understand that. He made her realize that and internalize that herself. He didn't need to tell her that. Whereas here, he just tells Merlina and that solves the problem, which I don't particularly like as much. And another thing that's maybe a bit more personal to me is that while it is perfectly appropriate for Sonic to look at these things in this kind of positive light, personally, when it comes to this kind of theme and this kind of topic, I don't agree with Sonic necessarily. You know, Sonic's optimistic view of this topic is nice and all, but in reality, maybe this is just me, I am not at all comforted by these ideas. Like, the inevitable fact that I'm going to die one day horrifies me to no end. And these nice fluffy thoughts of that's why you gotta make the most of life while you have it... Yeah, that doesn't really do anything to get away from the horrifying reality of death. This is one case where Sonic's boundless optimism and positivity doesn't really work for me, and I think it probably would have been better if we just avoided this entire topic because of that, but again, that might just be a personal thing for me. Though even disregarding my own personal take on things, I still feel that Sonic fans way over praise Black Knight for handling these themes, because this is far from the first time that a video game has tackled these kinds of topics, and in my opinion, many other games have handled it much better. They have a lot more to say and they dip a lot deeper into this topic and what it actually means and what it implies and the actual ramifications of it, and they have a lot more profound and meaningful things to say on the matter. Just some games off the top of my head that I can think of is Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, Persona 3, and especially The Outer Wilds. If you want to play games that actually take on this topic and really dive deep into it, those are the games we should be talking about, especially The Outer Wilds. FYI, The Outer Wilds is the best video game ever made, and if you haven't played it, then you should go do that. So I think personally that the story of Sonic and the Black Knight, in terms of how it handles its theme of death and learning to accept that, I really don't think that's particularly strong overall. 
However, I still do really like the story of this game because that is not the only theme present in Sonic and the Black Knight. There is another, much stronger theme that I feel is often overlooked when people talk about how great this game's story is. And it revolves around that ending gag of Sonic being King Arthur. There's more to it than that, that's not just a cute little joke. The entire game has been building toward this idea. You know, if we go back to the beginning, Sonic pulling Caliburn out of the stone. We now know that Caliburn is Excalibur. Sonic pulling Excalibur out of the stone. That is what King Arthur does in the original stories. And in those stories, no one is able to pull Excalibur out of the stone because they are not worthy. Only the one true king can pull Excalibur out of the stone. That says something about Sonic and his character, and we see that reflected multiple times throughout the story. It's all embedded in that clash between Sonic's mentality of embracing freedom and the rigid, strict chivalry of the world of King Arthur. Multiple times throughout the story, Sonic defies what a knight should be doing, but by doing that, he actually ends up proving that he is a true knight. And through all of these things and all these interactions, Sonic is slowly changing the mentality of this chivalrous world to no longer believe in such rigid and strict ideas that force people into these really bizarre and harmful ideas. The fact that someone's life becomes forfeit after a single failure is ridiculous, and Sonic is here to teach the people of this world that there's really no reason to live like that. And by doing that, he shows the Knights of the Round Table a different way. You don't have to just blindly follow a king. The real path toward being a knight is to just do what you believe is right. And by teaching these characters these things, they begin to trust him and respect him and follow him. And this extends past just the Knights of the Round Table. Sonic does this for all the people of the kingdom. There's a reason the experience points in this game are abstracted as followers, as civilians, as people that have begun to trust in Sonic and believe in him and start following him as their leader. And this idea is actually very well conveyed through the gameplay of Sonic and the Black Knight. For example, there's this one challenge here where you have to complete the level without taking a single hit, and that's a difficult thing to do on its own. But if you just do that and your goal is just to complete the level, then you're gonna end up getting a really bad rank. In order to get a good rank in this level, then not only do you have to complete it without getting hit, but you have to go into all these side areas onto these big prison barges where a bunch of civilians are being held captive and free them. And you have to do all of this without taking a hit. You have to take these extra risks and make things more difficult for yourself to help other people. Sonic's mentality of just doing what he wants and not concerning himself with what's right and what's wrong, that works because Sonic is truly good, and so the things he wants is good, and the things he wants is to help people in need. Sonic is truly the definition of a good person because he doesn't do what's right because it's good, he just does it because he wants to, it's just who he is as a person, helping people is just in his nature. In that way, Sonic is the truest knight of them all, and that comes through at the ending of the game when Sonic is on the ropes, and the thing that manifests Excalibur's true power is Sonic's mentality, is Sonic's belief in just doing what he wants. And then, that power is then amplified by the sacred swords of the other Knights of the Round Table. They give him their arms, their strength, their power. Sonic's strength of character has spread to the people of this kingdom and has taught them that the true way towards chivalry, the true way towards being a knight, is through doing what you believe in. And by teaching these people these things, they now believe in Sonic as their leader, and thus their strength manifests through him. And it is that strength that makes Excalibur reach its true form. 
Throughout the entire story, Sonic has been proving himself as being worthy of wielding Excalibur and thus being king, and this whole game does an excellent job of tying those ideas together and making them one and the same. Sonic is the true King Arthur. He united the Knights of the Round Table under him and he led them to defeat evil that was plaguing the kingdom and has now led the people into a new prosperous age. And this is all thanks to the fact that Sonic is a free spirit that just goes wherever the wind blows him. He does whatever he wants, and what he wants is the right thing, and through that, he spreads his good to the people of this kingdom. Honestly, this game does a fantastic job of weaving together the themes of Sonic with the story concepts of Arthurian legend. Much better than Sonic and the Secret Rings did with the stories of the Arabian Nights, this really captures, like, everything that both Sonic and King Arthur are about, all in one story really well tied together. I think that it's excellent. And, you know, as a bonus, you get that traditional Sonic theming of a character learning and growing and all that. It just has everything, and it does it all pretty well for the most part. It's really, really good. There's a reason that people say this is one of the best Sonic stories, and I most definitely agree with that. In fact, I would probably say that this is Shiro Maikawa's best work with the Sonic series. Like, this is pretty much on par with Sonic Adventure 2 but it doesn't have a lot of the same flaws that that story has. It kind of just manages to stick the landing with almost everything, and that makes it a great way for him to go out, as unfortunately, this is the last Sonic story that he ever told. But at least it's a good one that encapsulates what Sonic is very, very well. Though one last little weird thing I want to question about this game. It's called Sonic and the Black Knight, but there's no Black Knight in the game. I guess maybe King Arthur is supposed to be the Black Knight, because he's not really King Arthur, but he's not a Black Knight. His armor is gold, so there's no Black Knight in the game called Sonic and the Black Knight. That's weird. And before we go, we got one final little tidbit at the end here, where Sonic eventually somehow got out of the world of King Arthur, and he's explaining to Amy why he was late for their apparent date that they were going on, because, uh, sorry, Amy, I got sucked into a book, you see, and it turns out that I'm King Arthur. And she's just like, aha, uh -huh, really, that's why you missed our date. And then we end with once again the gag of Amy chasing after Sonic with the hammer. A little bit weird that apparently Sonic agreed to go on a date with Amy, but who knows what the heck the context of that is supposed to be. So that's the story of Sonic and the Black Knight. Thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, I'll see you next time.